Um, tell me how you became interested in gerontology. Well, it's many years ago, but I am happy to give credit to my undergraduate advisor for suggesting to me that there was this new developing field. So I was an undergraduate major in psychology, and as I was thinking about what my next steps would be, my, my advisor, Elizabeth Miller at Edgecliff College, who was just wonderful, um, she and I was interested in developmental psychology, and she said, well, you know, there's this whole new idea that there might be something to look at in terms of human development far into adulthood, that it doesn't end at it doesn't end at adolescence, it doesn't end at, at young adulthood, that, that human beings continue to grow and develop throughout their lives. So she said, it's a new field, There's, there actually happens to be some professors at Miami University who are studying this called gerontology and maybe you should check it out. Mm -hmm. So thanks to her, I did check it out, met Millie Seltzer, Bob Atchley, got to work on Bob Atchley's um, NIMH grant on adaptation to retirement and just have had, have been blessed with enormous opportunities ever since Elizabeth Miller suggested this to me. And when was that? I graduated from college in 1973 and I, for two years I worked uh, at the college that I graduated from as an admissions counselor, but I always knew I'd go to graduate school. I was always really interested in research, but she was the one who helped me figure out my next steps. Great. Um, describe, and you've kind of already started to do this a little bit, your career trajectory as a gerontologist. Well, in terms of disciplinary background, that to me that's one of the most amazing things about the field of gerontology as it's evolving. So I started, as every one of my generation did, with training in a, in a more traditional discipline. So my undergraduate degree was in psychology. Because I went to Miami for gerontology, that was within the sociology department. So one of the things that happened is I became a convert to the sociological perspective on on social problems, social life, social construction of everything. So my my one of a really important turning point for me was becoming interested in sociology, thanks to the fact that that's what where gerontology was housed. Um, and then everyone teaching had some ties to sociology. Millie was a social psychologist. Bob Ashley was a sociologist. So after um, doing my master's degree at Miami. And while working on my master's degree, I got to be a research associate, research graduate research assistant, as many of you know about um, know about that opportunity. I worked with Bob on this on this his research project as a research assistant. And then, when I finished my coursework, he offered me a job as a research assistant. I guess was my title at the time. And that job continued, grew, um, I got to have some, again, tremendous opportunities and I'm forever grateful to the people who have given me these opportunities over the years. But I got to do a little bit of teaching, I got to work with Millie on the internship class for gerontology students at Miami University and so my, the job grew and that allowed me to grow and it was just, um, again, just a, just such a fantastic opportunity. So I continued in a research job, but then got increasingly more responsibility or opportunities to be involved in in teaching, the educational piece of it all, and um, realized, you know, I, I love this, and I want to do this for a living for the rest of my life. So I went back to graduate school to get my PhD, had another sort of uh, revelation of what part of it, of what part of sociology was was really exciting to me, and that was demography and um, did my graduate work in, in those fields and came back to Miami and that's where I've stayed. Mm -hmm. And I feel, again, so lucky that I landed in that place and that I was surrounded by people who were so supportive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at what point in your career did you kind of embrace the idea of yourself as a gerontologist? That's, I love that question, that's a great question. Um, Another interesting uh, turning point in my life, when I came back from doing my PhD, well, so I was all about now, I'm not only a sociologist, I'm a demographer, and it, w it was Bob Ashley who said to me, you should, 
you should really give some thought to what it would mean to say you are a gerontologist. Well, because I had been a psychology major and then a sociology major accidentally, because that's where gerontology was offered, but then became a convert. And then, so for me, that identity as a, in a traditional discipline was really important. And it was probably just my own development as a, as, as a person and as a scholar. But when Bob said that to me and I thought, wow, why is it such a big deal? Well, again, having had the opportunity to be at a place where we continue to add the number of academic programs that we offer in gerontology and to have many discussions with fantastic colleagues about what makes, what is gerontology, uh, that went on for many decades in our field. Is it a discipline? Is it a profession? Is it a field of study? Is it a specialization? What should it be? Those debates were, were certainly intriguing, and I think they were a mark of how the field was evolving. I think probably other fields of study have been through exactly the same thing, including public health and social work and many others. So that debate was very informative to me, but Bob Ashley's words really stayed with me. And so I, I started seeing it all very differently and realizing that the debate about should we, are we a discipline, are we not a discipline, at some point it didn't matter because what was happening was that we had our own, we were developing our own theories of aging. We were developing our own methods unique to the study of processes of aging and life course. So we, whatever we called ourselves, we were becoming by all definitions a discipline. And then watching students graduate and go on to be professionals in the field or to go on for their own higher education and having faculty members join us with PhDs in gerontology, it's, I thought, well, if I'm not a gerontologist, what the heck am I? <laughs> I am a gerontologist. And not only am I a gerontologist, I am proud of the fact that Miami University has such a strong, powerful program in gerontology that attracts such great students and, and faculty. And so I always say it's, it is, and how can you not want to be a gerontologist when everything is related to aging, the world is aging? So I say all the time, it's a good time to be a gerontologist. So if ever you're thinking about becoming one, now's a good time to become one. <laughs> so for me, it was, again, probably part of my own maturation a little bit and sort of figuring out what I really am about. And uh, it's a good time to be a gerontologist. <laughs> Did you have any uh, female mentors who impacted your move, your transition um, into gerontology? Very definitely, and, and you know, I, I, I have been thinking about this, and, I'm, and I might get a little weepy, because I do owe a lot to these women. So I, I already mentioned Elizabeth Miller, whom, you know, I'm not sure I ever thanked her for how much guidance she gave me, and, and the, the nudges all along in my undergraduate career, but also afterwards. But then, I, Millie Seltzer changed my life. She changed my life in so many ways. One of the first things that she did for me, and again, I didn't even realize this. I was young, I was new, I didn't know how things worked. And in my first year of my master's program, Millie said, there's this conference in Chicago. I got an invitation to go. I can't go, but I want you to go. And it's on um, women in aging. So, and Millie was not my, my graduate supervisor at the time, but she said, you need to go. And I'll never forget saying to Bob, well, I'm going to miss work next week because I'm going to this conference that Millie wants me to go to. And he said, what? I didn't know anything about that. And I thought, she, I owe her a lot. I owe her a lot for, it, it, this was not a discussion. This was not a negotiation. This was, you are going to this conference and it's going to be great and you're, you're going to love it. And so that, that's a small instance, but it was, it was transformational. And, many ways she opened doors for me and that that being one of them but was just such a supportive person supportive and challenging always always ask for the deeper thought or explain what you mean or that sounds good but what do you what do you really mean so intellectually she was a wonderful mentor and personally she could not have been a more wonderful mentor again from from direct advice and guidance that she gave but also because of watching her mm. and who she was in the field and um i am going to get weepy <laughs> the 
she, Millie was brilliant and a, as a scholar, as an intellect, and she was just in a class of her own in terms of being able to build relationships and make connections and, and to do that for the, her students, for her colleagues. So watching Millie in a crowd, watching Millie meet someone new, watching Millie explain who we are and what we do at Miami University at the Scripture Ontology Center, just amazing. She was, it was, she was a natural edit and I watched her and thought, I want to be like that. So she was a role model in, in that way and, and in many other ways. Very honest, very direct. Um, it, you know, that's sometimes hard to be when you're, you know, you don't want to step on toes. But, and Millie didn't st step on toes, but she could be really honest. So she was that quite remarkable combination of good thinker, good communicator, and someone that you were just drawn to so that she could talk to you about anything. She could challenge you on anything. She could convince someone to let us develop a, pro a new program in gerontology. She could convince provosts and academic administrators. So, and she had deep ties to um, the administration on aging. Again, colleagues who were at some level also friends and just, she was just remarkable in that way. And I will always be grateful. I think of her all the time. I have, when Millie, after Millie retired, she kept an office for a while, but then when she got sick, she gave up her office, and when we were dismantling her office after she died, we, I mean, there were a few things that I kept as sort of just mementos of her, one of which is a lamp, an old lamp that I, but it just, that's what I saw when I walked into her office. The other thing I kept of Millie's is a file that she had of, um, what she called them, something like uh, possible titles, uh, unfinished thoughts, these sort of brilliant little snippets of things that could be worked into a speech or that could become, she was great at titles, very, had a real way with words. And, you know, it's just so much her big picture ideas, clever titles, clever ideas, um, crafted beautifully. And so I, 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 so I think of her a lot, sometimes when I run across something that I've kept of hers, uh, with her family's permission, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but um, sometimes just because I, sometimes I think, well, what would Millie say? What would Millie do? Mm -hmm. So she was that kind of role model. Mm -hmm. And we did keep, her family was very gracious in allowing us to um, keep some of her files of her manuscripts that she had written and um, copies of her publications. She had a lot of stuff in her home and a lot of stuff in her office. and so. We did, we have sort of an archive of Millie's work. So yes, she was an amazing woman in so many ways. I feel like I have not adequately captured everything that made her extraordinary, but she was. <laughs> it sounds like she contributed an awful lot to you and your career. She, she meant a lot to me personally. And also, I guess it's very important to mention, she was a leader in the field, as you, I'm sure you know. I mean, she helped get the Association for Gerontology and Higher Education off the ground, like really was in her heart and soul an educator mm -hmm. and a communicator. So she really was, she was a, 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 just an extraordinary person in the field. And so to have that person as my, the person I saw every day down the hall was, was really fortunate. But yes, personally, she meant a great deal to me. And I, I, I would like to live up to her standards. <laughs> unique about being a woman gerontologist? That's another really great question. Um, one of the things that I think is unique about being a woman gerontologist at the moment, it really is, this is starting to feel like a very, very uh, strong community of strong women scholars and leaders. I was at the um, executive committee orientation for GSA, for, the, for our new executive committee, and I'm, there might have been someone who couldn't be there, but it was, it's all women. All the new, the new leaders for the coming year are women. And if you look around, people who are getting the awards, where, where women are starting to really be recognized for our scholarship and our contributions. So I think being a woman in, gerontologist, in gerontology right now is, it's extraordinary because of how much this is our field. 
I do think there continue to be challenges, of course. Um, I think we, as with probably every discipline, there might be some where this isn't the case, maybe social work, where um, there's still, there's, we still could benefit from more diversity and more gender equality, but I really think gerontology has come a very long way in terms of. I guess that was kind of my follow-up question on that. So we, you spoke a little bit about what it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, where did we come from? And when did that kind of transition, if there was one, happen? That's an, another really great question. Well, and if we, uh, I, I guess my mind is very much on the big awards at GSA. I think they're all named for men. I, I think um, you, you talked about someone else who had mentioned walking into the GSA office in this wall full of white men. Um, it, you know, that, that, that's, that used to be the reality, not only in gerontology, but pretty much everywhere. So we came from, again, sort of the, a, a traditional institution discipline where it was dominated by, it was dominated by men. And not because there was a conspiracy or a, <laughs> a plot, but just because that's the way the world was. But it's time for that not to be the way the world is. Enough is enough. I had a, a similar experience going to Washington, D.C., a, a, a tremendous opportunity created for us by Miami University to talk about gerontology to uh, really all of the major Senate and House committees that had anything to do with aging, including, of course, aging, but um, uh, economic development, workforce, uh, labor, all kinds of special committees that we got to talk to. And every committee office has a picture of the members of that committee. And it's extraordinary, the absence of women on those committees and in the legislature and the absence of people of color in, in our legislature. So we have a long way to go. Gerontology may be leading the way in this. Mm -hmm. in this. We, we have our leadership is very strongly women. Um, it's and can you speak to, so you've talked about where we were, mm -hmm. where we are, uh, any, any reflections on how, we, how that transition, when that transition took place? You know, no, I, actually that's a really good question, but I can't say, I, I would have to say probably this meeting is when it was raised, not even just by me, but by other people looking around the room at leadership and saying, hmm, this, this is, uh, there's a lot of women in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when did it, it occur? I, I, I really couldn't pinpoint a time. It's certainly been gradual. When I was president of Augie, which was in the late 90s, early, maybe 2000, uh, there still weren't as many women on that on the wall of Augie presidents, that's for sure, and and still not very many women who were GSA presidents. So it seems like it's maybe been in the past ten or fifteen years, along with a lot of other changes mm -hmm. that have allowed women to express their strengths. How has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? <laughs> That's a really good question. Well, I guess gerontology is ultimately a very personal, a very personal topic as well as a very important societal topic in every other perspective. So, you know, I, I just came from a session where one of the presenters talked about, well, I'm, I'm older, so I'm bolder. That, I think because women, we have not been socialized to be allowed to be bold. There is something about, is there something empowering about growing older as a woman and realizing I've got stuff to say and there's nothing to stop me from saying it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So I, um, I um, kind of wanted to flip it just a little bit about, um, and this is my own personal question for you, which is, please describe how being a woman has impacted your own career in gerontology. Hmm, wow, that's a kind of a tricky question. How has being a woman impacted my own career? Well, maybe, um, I think I was, again, fortunate to be coming into the field at a time when there were some transformations taking place, including the, the Committee on Women and Aging, Women's Issues and Aging, and this conference that Millie had me go to. This, 
aging as a women's issue was being recognized. So being a, a woman in a field that was acknowledging that there, this is a gendered phase of life, as all of them are, mm -hmm. it probably opened doors. Being a woman sort of grants you legitimacy if you're studying a topic that is ultimately a women's issue. Not that there aren't men's issues as well, not, and not that there aren't universal issues regardless of gender, race, social class, but there, you know, so much of it is a gendered experience as most of human life is that I think in a field that recognizes the importance of women's issues, it's, it's helpful to be a woman. But I think there also were, you know, there still are stumbling blocks and obstacles. There still are numerous occasions of being in a room full of mostly white males who are fully good intentioned but who automatically just talk to each other and grant each other a legitimacy because of what they share in terms of their status and role in traditional society. So there still are challenges for sure. I, I, I guess I've, this is where aging and being a woman intersect nicely. I don't take it as personally anymore, but I also am not taking it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so the last question is, the Wiggle Project mm -hmm. focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Mm -hmm. So with that framework in mind, is there anything else you would like us to know? <sighs> Many things, uh, but it probably the most important is Maybe this is maybe this has this isn't a gender-based issue, but the privilege of watching new generations of gerontologists, women gerontologists, at these meetings. This is a great place to be doing these interviews because I, I'm just struck by the talent, the brilliance, the innovativeness, the productivity, the achievement, the camaraderie among the new generations of, of gerontologists. And, and there are a lot of women gerontologists these days. So it's, it really, if, if I can think for a moment that I had an impact on those future generations, then I will feel like I have succeeded. If I, if I have, if I'm leaving anything behind in terms of nurturing, supporting, challenging, helping those new generations of gerontologists grow and succeed, I, that's all I can ask for.